These people are part of an experiment. We are about to test the urban myth, six degrees of separation. The idea that in a world of more than six billion people, everyone is connected by just a few steps. That's to say that you know someone who knows someone who knows someone who knows someone who knows, someone who knows me or anyone else on the planet. When scientists began exploring six degrees, they made some profound discoveries. Nature has a hidden blueprint, a structure that connects us all. The world is more highly, more globally, and more unexpectedly connected than we ever thought. Investigating an urban myth has led to an entirely new branch of science, network theory and some believe it will change our lives. Networks are important because if we don't understand networks, we can't understand how markets function, how organizations solve problems, or how societies change. Nations, species, individuals, corporations, and armies will be affected by the new science of networks. Scientists are now exploring whether the power of six degrees can defeat terrorism, predict pandemics, and perhaps even cure cancer. It may prove to be one of history's great breakthroughs. And if it does, the one person we can thank is Hollywood actor Kevin Bacon. Mark Vidal is a geneticist at the Dana Farber Cancer Institute in Boston. He's the target of our experiment to test six degrees of separation. The claim that everyone on the planet can be connected to everyone else in just a few steps. Is it real or just an urban myth? We'll find out. Bei über 6,8 Milliarden Menschen auf der Welt wird es, denke ich mal, ganz schön schwierig, die richtige Person ausfindig zu machen. We've chosen 40 people from around the world to see if they can get a package to Vidal. I have difficulty believing that they're going to be successful in delivering that package. Our participants have never met him, and they aren't allowed to look him up on the internet. The rules are simple. They must try and get the packages to Boston by passing it to family or friends people they know on a first name basis. The US has about 300 million people, so um, this seems to be a bit like looking for the needle in the haystack. Will any of the packages make it to Boston? And how many steps will they take? Eight? Eight steps, maybe? One of our starters is college student Jessica Otto. She lives in the German town of Wilk, near Dusseldorf. She's planning to send her package to a friend in Canada. I've sent the package to Kat. She's a friend of mine. We've known each other like forever. She moved to Canada to her boyfriend and to start studying there. I thought because her boyfriend, he studied in Boston and he has to do something with physics and I thought he would know a lot of professors and I'm pretty sure that one of those knows Mark Vidal. Testing six degrees is at the heart of understanding our complex society. A decade ago, the idea began intriguing a small group of researchers trying to explain the world using mathematics. It would eventually lead to the new science of networks. One of the founders of the science is Professor Steve Strogartz. His path to discovery began with a broken love affair. Romeo's love increases the more Juliet is currently loving him. So our dot would be A. The more that Romeo currently loves her, the more that she recoils and wants to run away and hide. <laughs> looks like I, I had a 
tumultuous relationship. It was the first relationship of my life with a a girl in college, and I couldn't understand what she was doing to me. And uh, whenever I seemed to get closer to her and try to to show her how much I loved her, she would back away. And then when I realized I better give up, this isn't going anywhere, then she was strangely attracted to me. And this push and pull felt to me, and probably this is why I had so much trouble with her, (laughs) it felt to me like a mathematical equation. And so I started to write equations for this give and, and take or push and pull between two people, equations for the growth or decay of their love as a function of time. This to me is a beautiful thing. The unity of nature, that's something you can learn in physics, has the same mathematical description as the, the oscillations of a love affair, the ups and downs of a, of a romantic relationship. The same formulas. Having successfully conquered romance with equations, Strogartz turned his attention to other mysteries. Nothing had perplexed him more than the phenomenon known as synchronicity. How can a population of dissimilar individuals suddenly synchronize? How do fireflies flash in unison across great distances? Or crickets chirp as one? How does order emerge from chaos? We're so used to thinking that if there's a group following, acting in concert, it's because there's a conductor for the orchestra. But that's not necessarily so. There's a hundred billion brain cells acting like the most complicated thing in the universe. And there's no cell that is the master conductor of the brain. The brain does it as a group. The heart has 10,000 pacemaker cells that tell the rest of the heart when to beat. Who's in charge? Who's the pacemaker for the pacemaker? Nobody. Strogatz was not alone in his passion for the simple elegance of numbers. Duncan Watts also wanted to make sense of the world with maths. Here we are, sort of, just kind of shambling through uh, life, trying to make sure the wheels don't come off. But nothing like science. And I started to think, this is what I should be devoting my life to, to try and bring something like science to this, this real world. Watts had abandoned a promising career as Australia's top naval graduate to study physics. And when he arrived at Cornell University, Professor Strogartz knew this was no ordinary grad student. I mean, he was absolutely perfectly physically fit. I didn't immediately think of him as a, you know, this is a likely candidate for for doing deep mathematics. And later when I walked by his office, I saw a picture of him hanging by his fingertips from uh, a sheer cliff in Australia. And I thought, that's the kind of person that I could see myself working with on a a difficult problem. We would try to do something intellectually dangerous, to go to some place at the edge, some place that that people hadn't really thought about before, possibly even a question that doesn't seem like uh, a question you're allowed to think about. I like those problems that are that are almost taboo, because that's where there's a lot to be discovered. Together, they began to investigate the unsolved mystery of synchronicity. And for that, they needed a real-world example to study. It occurred to us that actually here in Ithaca, we have the world champion of synchronization called Snowy Tree Crickets. On a warm summer evening, thousands of them will all start chirping in unison. If we could capture some of these crickets, could we predict from an individual's behavior how an enormous population of hundreds or thousands of crickets would behave as a group? So we would find a tree and then I would clamber up in the tree with a flashlight on my head and a little glass vial and try and find these critters. Well, the hope was that each individual cricket was actually obeying little mathematical rules, unconsciously, that that each cricket 
when responding to the chirp of another cricket, just shifts its rhythm by a certain amount that was very reproducible. I would sit there for you know three hours waiting for the damn crickets to chirp and they wouldn't chirp. Testing individual crickets would never work. The answer seemed to lie elsewhere. You have you know, hundreds of these crickets and they're all sort of interacting with each other in some kind of complicated way. And the question that came up in my mind over and over again was, you know, who is listening to whom? And so that got him thinking more generally about patterns of connections, about networks. And it was around that time that something his father said came into his mind. Do you know that you're only six handshakes from any person on earth? And I started to think maybe it's true that, the, that this six degrees of separation phenomenon applies in the real world. And what are the consequences, if that's true, for the synchronization of crickets, for the, the way that the disease spreads throughout a human population, the dynamics of markets, and all these sorts of uh, questions seem to have something to do with networks. And it was almost a scary thought because we could see when he, when he suggested it to me, that, that we were on the brink, if we could do anything sensible, of a whole new science that didn't exist yet. Almost by accident, they'd stumbled across a huge gap in our knowledge. Amazingly, no one before had paid much attention to the structure of networks. It was at that you know, pivotal moment, I really sort of forgot about the crickets and started to think about networks. And to understand networks, they would need to explain how six degrees of separation might actually work. In our experiment to test the idea, the packages are sent from locations all over the world. <laughs> In Paris, dancer Nadia Tomasova believes her letter has a good chance of making it. I think somebody could send this to me because maybe as I traveled around the world, it makes me very connected around the world. Yeah. I'm sending it to my friend in Boston, to Josephine Ka. She's a ballet dancer. I hope she will get it. Nadia is part of an international network of dancers. To her, the big world appears small. Is six degrees as simple as that? Mathematically, it's pretty easy to make small worlds. If I know a hundred people, and each of them knows a hundred people, then already within two steps of me, two degrees of separation, there's a hundred times a hundred. And so if I do another step, so now three degrees, that's a million people, and keep playing like that, and you'll see that within five steps, you've got more people than there are on the whole Earth. But there's something terribly wrong with that calculation. It may be true that I know 100 people, and each of them knows 100, but a lot of those are the same people, right? It's not 100 new people each time. There's a lot of overlap in our social circles. And so this is what makes the problem very difficult. In a Kenyan village, one of our participants is struggling with this problem. <laughs> Nia Loka knows everyone in her village of Nimware, but nobody seems to know anyone who can get the package closer to Boston. In Nimware, the world still seems very large. But it's not a problem restricted to Kenyan villages. No matter where we live or what we do, we all tend to know people very much like ourselves. 
we're clustered into closed circles, locked within our own social networks. This is the paradox at the heart of the small world problem, that the, the world is simultaneously very small, with everyone only a few steps from everyone else, and yet very clustered. The paradox of small worlds seemed an insurmountable challenge. And so we just started to play around. It was pure mathematics, fun and games, where a network is thought of as points connected by lines. And then asking whether they would have the property of being a small world, meaning that everyone is only a few uh, hops away from everyone else in the network. Watts began with a thought game, a mathematical model. Imagine uh, we, we have a crowd in a soccer stadium. And now imagine that you're trying to do the experiment of getting a message from this part of the stadium to the farthest remote part of the stadium. And the only way that we can get a message is to talk to the person next to us, right? And then that person has to talk to the person next to them. It's going to take a very long time for the message to get from there to there. Now if I give the person on the other side of the, uh, uh, the soccer stadium a, a walkie-talkie and I have the other one, we can communicate immediately. Clearly our path length has shrunk because now the person next to me can communicate with the person on the other side of the stadium simply by asking me to put a call. All of a sudden a whole group of people in my local neighborhood can connect to a whole group of people on the other side of the stadium in many, many fewer steps than they could before this one link came into existence. Just a single random link has an enormous effect. And add just a few more links and distance in the stadium has all but disappeared. The world doesn't gradually get smaller, it drops off a cliff. Here was a model that could easily make a big world small. Does our experiment show any sign of it actually happening? <laughs>